Amen. Okay, so uh, we're going to hand this mic over to, uh, or that mic, your mic's going to be activated <laughs> soon. It already is. Yes, Praise sir. God. <laughs> so uh, Eric and Casey and their family, um, they're, they're going to be able to tell you as much of their story as they want. But I just want you to know they were radically impacted at Brownsville. Then uh, upon he receiving the call of God, five families in 2003 moved to the Philippines. Five families moved. Um, uprooted their kids, moved into a foreign land, and uh, they've been there ever since. And um, so they can tell whatever they desire to, but these guys are the real deal. And um, I do want to share this in case you forget. God is doing great things with them, opening doors. There's uh, some shortwave radio that's come available to these guys that is aimed into Asia. So like Japan, North Korea, China, these types of areas, and God supernaturally provided the funds for them. So uh, Eric's stepping into that, and just really um, a heart for Japan and, and some of the Indonesia type areas. So God is um, really at this stage in their life elevating them, I believe. They feel like they're somewhat in transition. So um, they could minister for weeks to us from what God has done in them, but alas, we only have two services. So come on up, guys. Take the floor. We're going to receive from you. Give them a welcome. Amen. Thanks, Jim. Awesome. Well, my ayong buntag. Thank you. Oh, somebody got that. Okay. Got it. Awesome. Just just testing the waters. You don't know out here in, where, where are we, Duncanon? Duncanon. You never know. There could be a Filipino or two around. But we actually met one that the other day. We went to Ken Kenobles. And uh, I like Kenobles. I know it's for kids, but um, I'm a 47-year-old kid. <laughs> no, it was awesome. We met some Filipinos in the line, and it was fun to talk to them. And uh, just, we're always looking for Filipinos. We lived there for uh, 17 years, and then we came to the States in uh, March last year, and uh, haven't been able to leave. <laughs> I'm trying, but can't leave. Uh, but the Lord knows when, and uh, you know we love missions work. I think when when personal revival takes place in your heart, you can't help but want to tell the world about Jesus. Amen. I think that's what our sister was talking about. Wherever she was, was it Haley? Oh, she okay. And uh, you know when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, you gotta you gotta release. You know, salvation is like a fountain of living water. That's what Jesus said. But then the baptism of the Holy Spirit is like a river that comes from you. And that's what we want, right? I can't live off of your fountain, right? But we can encourage each other with the river that flows from our lives. So there's something to say. Yeah, it's awesome to get saved and, and know where you're going for eternity, to have a personal relationship with Jesus. But it's another thing to overflow with the presence of God and and I'm, I'm from New York. I'm, I got a big mouth, um, you know, kind of a loud personality. And I'm not saying you have to have that in order to be effective to tell people about what Jesus has done in your life. You just have to be free from shame. You just have to be free from fear, right? Free from whatever it is that's controlled us. Maybe religion. Having a form of godliness but denying the power, right? You know, I think that's what the Lord's done in us. And uh, I'm going to share a little bit of our testimony, but then also have a word I want to share with you today. But I just want to open up with a word of prayer. Amen? Amen? Holy Spirit, thank you so much for Abundant Harvest Church. Lord, Pastor Tim and Lauren and, and the leaders here. God, I thank you for the work of what they're doing here in Duncanon. And Lord, we bless it in Jesus' name. Lord, I ask that you would open the heavens even wider than what it is, God, and pour out your Spirit fresh and new upon us. It's not something I can make happen, nor do I want to make happen. I want you to do the work, Jesus. I want it to be about you, Jesus. That's what, we're, that's what we seek after, Lord. Lord, I, I've never saved anybody. I've never healed anybody. I've never set any captive free. That's only what you do. God, you're looking for us to be a temple of your Spirit a people of prayer, a people devoted to you, a family, Lord, that is sold out to you, Jesus. I pray that in this region, in this part of America and the world, God, that you would move in great, 
power yes. and raise up for yourself a people that are not identified by a building or, or Lord, by their past or, or how successful they are, Lord, but simply by the presence of God. Yes. We need your presence more than ever before. Yes. We love you. I, I thank you for your anointing. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So as, as uh, Pastor Tim was saying, we've been missionaries since 2003, uh, about 17 years, 18 years, if you count this past year. And it's been a wild ride. <laughs> Uh, I, I grew up in upstate New York, about an hour north of New York City, and uh, moved to Delaware, where I became a youth pastor for three and a half years. And during that time, I met my wife, Casey, in January of 97, we got married. And, you know, for the next probably eight months, you know, we looked like everything was fine, but behind the scenes, I had all kinds of you know, anger issues, lust, pride, just a mess. And I was a youth pastor, you know. You can, you can know all about God, but not know God. That's If there's anything I learned from the Brownsville Revival, it's that right there in a nutshell. I would say, you know, if you don't know what that revival was in Father's Day of 1995, the Lord poured out His Spirit, a church was seeking in prayer for God to move in revival for at least two and a half years, and I know people who've been a part of that church for even longer than that said that that was something they were longing for for even years before. And um, and then God poured out His Spirit, brought a man named Steve Hill, who's an evangelist, and he ended up at this Assembly of God church, Brownsville Assembly of God in Pensacola, Florida. It's not the most exciting area of Pensacola and Florida. It's uh, actually Pensacola in that area of Brownsville is a really rough area. There's prostitution out on the street, all kinds of drugs. It's, it's, a, it's a tough area. But how many of you know that's where God likes to move? Yeah. If God doesn't move in those places, He only moves in the nice, uh, pristine, clean, everything, you know, is perfect places, then we're all in trouble. Yeah. But uh, He moved there, and in the f first, that revival lasts for about five years, and in the first six months of the revival, 130,000 people got saved. There was no social media. There was no advertisement. The advertisement was people's lives were being changed. And they just started to come. And so a line would form in front of the church every day. Started small and then got bigger. By the time we got there, revival lasted for five years. So every Friday night, there were water baptisms like tonight, which I'd encourage you to make sure you be there whether you're getting baptized or not. And if you want to be water baptized, make sure you let us know. <laughs> and, and every Friday night for five years, these water baptisms, people would come from all over the world. I remember over a hundred nations being represented in different services in Pensacola. This is not New York City. This is not Chicago or Miami or LA. This is Pensacola. <laughs> People, people don't even think about Pensacola when they go to Florida. They go to Orlando. They go to Tampa, right? They go uh, even farther south. But people would get stuck in Pensacola. And God would move in power. And, uh, you know, all these people were getting saved. Well, Casey and I didn't get down there until April of 98. We had, as I said, I was a youth pastor in a church. And I got tired of living as a hypocrite a double lifestyle, and I repented in front of the church in Delaware, uh, Dagsboro, Delaware. I don't know if anybody knows where Dagsboro is. You do? <laughs> okay, you know Pensacola and Dagsboro. I think you've been messing, following us, man. Uh, no, but it's, uh, it's just a small town. There's not much in Dagsboro. And our church was had grown from 100 to 500 in about three and a half years. The youth group that I was responsible for had about 15 when it started, and, uh, and I think we had like 75 plus. That, that was normal. We looked very successful. Church of God, Pentecostal church, but then living a double life. And after a while, you, you know, your sins will find you out. <laughs> 
So you, you can repent in mercy or God can expose things because He loves you. And, and God chose to allow things to be exposed in my life. And I am so grateful for that. Because I repented in front of the church on, in August of 97. And when I walked down the middle of the aisle to meet my wife at the back door, people were shocked. Nobody was expecting that. Um, the pastor knew, cause, and some of the elders, because I came to them. And, you know, they, they didn't force me to do that. I, I did it on my own. And... And when I did, I walked down the middle of the aisle and I felt like chains with like hooks in my flesh were pulled out of me. It's really powerful. That's the way I've always described my testimony. And then in, in within a year, we went through a year of restoration with Church of God. We went to the Brownsville Revival. And all I can say is when I walked through the doors of that church, it was like walking under Niagara Falls. <laughs> the presence of God was so intense. And how many of you know that when God touches you initially, that's only the beginning? He's trying to sp spread Himself out in your life, help renew your mind, your attitudes, your patterns of thinking, and change, change your spiritual taste buds, right? To remove idolatry from your life and teach you how to become a man or a woman of God that's after His heart. You know, I, I was, had this great deliverance and breakthrough, but there were so many other things God was touching on my life and Casey's life. And one of those things that God really did in our lives was touch our marriage and our family. When we first got married, I would say that our, and Casey will attest to this, our marriage probably looked like, if you've ever seen WWE wrestling, <laughs> I mean... We try to cast demons out of each other. We did all kinds of crazy. I'm, I'm not. I mean, I'm not making this up. You know, I know New Yorkers exaggerate, but not today. Okay, but we we were a mess. And I want to let you know, if your marriage is a mess and your family is a mess, that Jesus can clean things up. But let me tell you how He's going to start by you taking responsibility and not point the finger at anybody else. And, and, and immediately, God began to change our hearts and minds. Because when, when, how many of you know that revival is not so much about corporate meetings, it's about God getting a hold of your heart? That's right. And when God changes this, He changes this. Yeah. And when He changes the marriage, He changes the family. When He changes the family, revival comes to the church, the corporate body. Right. See, revival's not for the lost, it's for the church. Right. And when the church gets back to normal... A thing called awakening happens amongst the lost. That those who are living in darkness begin to see a great light. Jesus told us to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth. And so in order for that to happen, we've got to change. I don't blame what's happening in America on President Biden. I mean, everybody plays their part. But I'm going to tell you this. If my people, which are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and heal their land. That's a promise of God to us. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I want to talk to you briefly today about taking back the rainbow. Taking back the rainbow. Recently, our family, as we've been, tra we've been traveling for the last 17, 18 months. And it's, it's been wild. We uh, haven't been able to live in our house in the Philippines that we rent. And so we, we actually just gave up our house recently. And so we gave away most of our furniture so that they can easily move and box up things there. Uh, because, you know, you don't, you don't have to have a house to be a family. Amen. I mean, it's nice. <laughs> and, and right now we're at Tim and Lauren's house. It's been great. They're awesome hosts, you know. Lauren can cook with the best of them, man. And uh, they've been such a blessing, you know, and thank you everybody who, who those who may have given for us to go to Knobles and, and whatever else we've done. And we, we did some, uh, what was it? Not uh, rafting, the kayak. kayak. Kayak, never been in a kayak before and uh, we loved it and, and I won, so yeah. Um, anyway, okay, so be quiet. Okay, I got the microphone. Um, isn't he a good worship leader? Yes. Yeah. 
God's using these kids. Amen? That's why we're taking back the rainbow. But while we've been traveling, we have had... I, I wish my wife had time. She could take 20 minutes up here just to talk about all the encounters with rainbows. Okay? I don't, I'm, I don't want to sound flaky or anything like that. I'm just telling you, it's been something that God has been doing, trying to get our attention. And so because he's changed our marriage and our family so much, and that's such an important value to us, that I, I believe that one of the reasons why he has us here in the States is to not only encourage a church for revival, but encourage people practically how to get things in order and why. And some of these things in America, we will say, we know I've heard this stuff, but it's another thing to apply them. Amen. Be a doer of the word, right? Not a hearer only. That's what James said. And so, when we recently went to Hawaii for a missions trip, isn't that awesome? Hawaii missions trip. That was, it was, it was kind of hard for us to reconcile because we had friends from Brownsville days who've worked. Anybody ever hear of Lou Engel uh, in the call? Okay, so they've worked closely with Lou Engel for the last fifteen plus years, and are were Lou's like chief intercessors. So these people pray and fast like all the time. And they know how to hear from God. They were a great encouragement to our family in Pensacola. They had eight children. And all of them are, are, are grown. And their last daughter just graduated from high school. They're all married to godly spouses. And have godly families. All in ministry in different capacities. Some are working in ministry. But uh, they've been inviting us to come to Hawaii for quite a number of years. And, I mean, the Philippines is beautiful itself, and it's not as commercialized as Hawaii, so we never really felt much of a need to go to Hawaii. But we didn't realize how much people need Jesus there. <laughs> and not only the Hawaiians, but how much... It, it, it's just a rough place in some areas. And we went to a place called the Big Island, uh, which is the southernmost region of the United States, if you didn't know that. And... When we were, we had to drive to uh, Kona to fly out the last day we were there in April. And while we were leaving, we had turned a corner and it was going to be about 15, 18 miles to the airport. Well, we had this rainbow literally follow us the entire way to the airport. Now, I don't know much about rainbows and science and all that stuff. So if you know more than I do, that's great. But I still believe the Lord was speaking to us through it. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it was just, you know, something the Lord did for us. I mean, I'm, I think a lot of people saw it. <laughs> but I know that as we were going, it just felt really unique that the Spirit of God is constantly telling us, I'm with you. I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. Mm -hmm. I mean, He did do those things for Israel, right? Cloud by day, fire by night. I'm sure they saw some rainbows <laughs> in the desert, in the wilderness. How many of you know that it's good to see a, a rainbow in the wilderness sometimes? It's good to know that there's the refreshing of the Holy Spirit upon you, that things are not always up to you, that if you would trust that it's not by His might or, or your might or power, but it's by His Spirit, that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you, you will be able to do the things that Jesus did and even greater. And, and what am I talking about? Well, we've been able to send back money every month and we've had to double our food to our feeding program in the Philippines because of COVID. People haven't worked. If you're under 21, you're not allowed to leave the home for the past year. You have to have face mask, face shield. It's so restricted there. That's why we can't go back. And we have a feeding program we've had for about 12 years where we feed 100 children every week. And these families don't have other options. And so when we're feeding these kids, it's extremely important. When that was shut down, we had to think of, think of unique ways for them to come to our building so we can hand out food to the parents and then they would come and go. But we've actually doubled the food because it, it was there's so much need. And, you know, we, we have a fire school, a ministry over there, a Bible school, where we train up, raise up Filipino missionaries and send them out. We have multiple missionaries that have gone internationally, and a lot of them locally, planning churches, feeding programs, evangelism, reaching out to teenagers. There's, there's so much that's going on in the Philippines. 
But one of the things that God has done in our life, in our marriage, in our family, is to understand that, you know, when, when we see a rainbow, I don't just think of God holding back judgment. I also think about family. You know, even... And it made me think about this again when we got here because Casey, we were in, I'm not going to say it right, Lancaster, right? I say it right? Lancaster. Lancaster. Okay. Not Lancaster. Okay. That's what I was saying all along. But we, we were there before we came here and she got these beautiful rainbow sandals. She, yeah, because of all the stuff that the Lord's been speaking to us about it. She was all excited about it. And we got to Tim and Lauren's, and, and they had their dog attack Casey's sandal. I'm just kidding. They didn't do that on purpose. No, the dog came in the room while nobody was looking and, uh, and grabbed one of Casey's sandals, and it, it doesn't look like a rainbow no more. But, but she's fine. There's forgiveness, no offense towards the dog. And uh, the dog has literally licked my day legs for the last three days. But no, it's, it's, he's, he's a lot of fun. He's a really cool dog. So it, it made me think about that there's been a spiritual breakdown in marriages and families. That's, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to realize that in America. And I believe this has given rise to the perversion in America and in the nations. And, and the rainbow does not belong to the world. It belongs to God. And so now it's been perverted to mean something that God never intended it to mean. Yeah. You know, just before we went to Firebrand last weekend, we went to the Ark Encounter in Kentucky. Anybody ever been there? I would encourage you to go if you can. And in the Ark Encounter, they, they, you, they have a replica of the Noah's Ark. I mean, it's incredible. You just have to go there to see it, to appreciate it. And when we got there, there's a section in the ark where they try to make it look like what they think the, the Bible explains. And there's this one section that's in the middle, and it has all these nice little cartoon character things, and it's called Fairy Tale Ark. These are some of the signs that they had. Now, they had hundreds of books in there, Children's books about Noah and the flood, the ark. How many of you know that there's nothing really childlike about Noah and the flood? Okay, I understand the animals. <laughs> but we need to recognize that the world was destroyed. Amen. It's not, oh, look at Johnny, the world was destroyed. You know, we're not saying it like that. So they had these warning signs that were in that area saying, Warning, cute arcs are dangerous. They distort God's word and ultimately malign his character. Okay. Attention, the flood was God's judgment of a wicked world, not a happy story about adorable animals. Amen. And here's another two quotes. First one is, if I, and this is like the enemy speaking, the devil speaking. If I can convince you that the flood was not real, then I can convince you that heaven and hell are not real. Amen. True. And then the last one I quoted uh, a part of Genesis 7.23. Everyone died. Everyone died except eight people in the ark. Yep. Everyone died. When we see that rainbow, that's not just science. God put that there. Right. To remind us, people say all the time, I want to see miracles. I want to see God do something divine and powerful. Well, you ever see a rainbow? Oh yeah, but that's what? But that's what? Something you don't want to believe? Or we don't want to understand that God put that in the sky to remind us constantly throughout the centuries that he has no desire that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance again. Yeah, that's good. While Jesus has become our ark of safety, I believe God's desire is for the church, the family of God, to be the physical representation of the rainbow which leads people to Jesus, the ark of safety. 1 Timothy 3, 1-5 says this, Paul speaking to Timothy, but mark this, 
there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to parents. Isn't that interesting? Everything is connected to the breakdown of marriage and family. The reason why we become selfish is because we don't know how to honor one another above ourselves in the family. That's why people want two kids right now and, and no more. One boy, one girl, I'm perfect. Uh, I, and I'm not saying if you haven't had more than two kids or haven't had kids for whatever reason that you're not obedient. But I want to tell you something. We've, we've got five kids. We have two older daughters and they're in Florida working for the summer. And we get all kinds of looks sometimes. And I don't even think we have that big of a family. You go to the Philippines, eight is like a normal number. I, we uh, or more and then we have I did a funeral for a lady once who was number 18 of 20 kids that, that's, a, that's a village <laughs> you got to have a census there but I, isn't it interesting we become so selfish and, and, and we're not caring about things anymore because I believe ultimately not only the breakdown of our relationship with Jesus, but then also our breakdown in marriages and families that will be ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure, pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying it power, have nothing to do with such people. What does this mean? It means if we as a church do not only fight for our relationship with God, but fight for our marriages and for our children, the family, that we will not be a rainbow to be visible to lead those to the ark of safety who is now Jesus. God doesn't need to build any more arks. Jesus came and finished it all. Amen. He is the ark of safety now. But the family, I think, God wants to use us like a rainbow to kind of lead us to remember where we need to go and what we need to do and why God's wrath was poured out upon Jesus so that we can be totally restored and healed. If the church does not fight, and value God's design for marriage and family, we're going to... The, the world will not have hope. Now, I understand that God leads people through dreams, visions, divine appointments. But the majority of people who, got sa who get saved do so through relationships. Even in crusade meetings, gatherings, TV ministry, radio, internet, whatever. There's all kinds of YouTube preachers now. And I want to tell you, that's awesome, and God uses it, but God uses people. That's right. always been His desire. Why? Because He reveals Himself as Father. He doesn't reveal Himself as the CEO and President of Heaven Incorporated. I mean, He could have done that. He could have revealed himself in, in a more technical way, not a relational way. But God is, the whole purpose of Jesus coming was not just to die on the cross for our sin. It was to restore us back to relationship with the Father so that we might be healed. How many of you know when a father is in the life of the children, they, they tend to grow in confidence. They tend to, to grow in strength. I mean, obviously, mothers and fathers have a, a, such a key role. And when that changes, uh, sometimes I feel like when I say these things that people get angry at me because they're like, well, you don't know what I've been through. No, I haven't. I don't, you don't know what I've been through. <laughs> All I know this is this, is that we've fought for our marriage and I'm not ashamed of what we have. And then people look at us and they say, why are your kids so on fire? Why do your kids love to worship Jesus? Why are this and that? And I, and I will say because we honor Jesus in our home and we don't, you know, have, uh, you know, the WWE thing in our home anymore. No, we fight for what we have. 
And, and even though we're moving all the time and, and we're been uprooted from the Philippines to going here and doing all kinds of stuff that we never expected after being there for 17, 18 years. Friends, we've ministered all over the island of Mindanao, throughout the Philippines, been to different nations. It's incredible. We absolutely love it. But I want to tell you, our ministry is not based on a structure. It's not based solely on vision. It's based on relationships. The reason we come to this church is not because we've just been invited and want to be preachers that blow in, blow up, blow out. We want to build relationship. We don't, we don't need to stay in a hotel. I'm not interested in being a Christian celebrity at all. Jesus is the celebrity. <laughs> but that's why we want to come. We want to get to know people. We have a lot of similarities and in, 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 you know, history and things like that. And, it, and, it's, and it's awesome. But there's nothing like getting to know folks and encourage one another. And I hope we get to know some of you. We, we are going to stick around for the water baptism uh, tonight too. So we look forward to getting to know some of you. But why is family so important? Well, Psalm 68 verse 6, the first part of that verse says, God sets the lonely into a family. Yes. The loneliest people in the world are people who don't know Jesus. I'm not saying people who go to church. You can go to church and still feel lonely. You can, still go, you can go to church and feel like you stick out like a sore thumb, but nobody else is thinking about it except you. Right? Or you can still have all these issues on the outside, but God knows our heart. God sets the lonely in the family. The church has to be not a building but a people, a place where the glory of the Lord abides. You know, I think the reason why we're okay to bring people to buildings and not into our lives, open our lives, our homes, and, and hospitality, that's something that's been lost. And in and, and the church nowadays, we say, well, I don't really have the gift of hospitality. No, but you have the Holy Spirit who lives in you. I think he's pretty hospitable. I mean, I'm not saying you've got to be as good as somebody else and as gifted as someone else. All I'm saying is you've got to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Okay. Who's my neighbor? <laughs> Jesus answered that question, right? Look, it's easy to bring people to church. It's another thing to open our lives to them. Good. We've probably had 50, 60 people live in our home over the last 17 years. Short term, long term. We've had transvestites off the street come and live with us. You're like, whoa, I don't know about that. I'm not saying you have to do that. But I'm say this, is that I hated homosexuals. Absolutely hated them. Because my uncle, who was a singer on Broadway in New York City, he was incredible. All kinds of different shows and things like that. He got into that crowd. Now, he was never... Uh, so much into it but he lived that way um, at like I mean he wasn't on the outside flamboyant and things like that but I'll tell you this it broke my heart when he got AIDS and he died in the mid 90's because I didn't know much about that I was growing up as a young man and trying to understand and learn and so I had no reason to hate homosexuals before that but when that happened I felt anger in my heart so years later I'm teaching on evangelism in the Philippines and there's probably about two three hundred people in this church and the power of God comes down and people are all over the floor there's probably 50 people in front of me just getting set free from demonic it was an incredible moment if you don't believe that come with me sometime yeah, That's right. and while people are getting set free and I'm about to close the meeting I have about six guys with me that I was mentoring at the time and uh, I get in the car and the Lord says, are you going to teach evangelism or are you going to do it? He says, go to Curino Street. It's like 9, 9.30 at night. Curino Street, we, have, as we live in a city of 2 million people. Curino Street is where all the transvestite prostitutes are at night. He said, go down there. I didn't want to go down there, but I did. And God began to break my heart for these folks. 
I began to listen to their stories. We began to pick them up and, and minister to them, bring food to them. I, I, I mean, I, some were, were, went through horrible things. And it's amazing how God could put compassion in your heart for people that you didn't like at first yeah. Yeah. and teach you how to love them the way that He does. We've mentored some of these guys, came out, and some didn't. You know, so much rejection and pain and hardship, but God sets the lonely into a family. If I, I brought them to church. Oh, I, I had times where I, I picked up probably 15 of these guys and had a like a, an older u- utility vehicle and they all got in the vehicle, 15 of them. It was interesting. So we, we got out. I went to the building that we our church rented, and we were on the second floor. On the bottom is an open bar outside, and there's tons of people. So I parked right in front there. Here's this big white guy getting out with 15, you know, transvestites, you know. <laughs> and uh, but after a while, I, I wasn't really ashamed of it anymore. Not because I engaged in any of that but because I started seeing them break with tears because somebody reached out to them and loved them. Look, I'm not trying to say you have to go do that. What I am saying, though, is you have a home and you have relationships, and if you're afraid to bring people into it, I'm going to question how much freedom is in your life with Jesus. Because what would Jesus do? (laughs) Again, I love the idea that you're talking about doing home groups and stuff this fall. It'll change this church when you do stuff together outside of this building. It will challenge you. I promise you it will challenge you. That's why you need to get things right at home if you need to. If things are right, then you have more to offer than you realize. I don't believe there's only one pastor in a church. I believe there's multiple pastors, shepherds, people that God raises up Men and women that he will use to disciple people. Didn't Jesus give us the great commission to make disciples of all men? I'm going to skip a scripture here. Ephesians 5. I'm going to read this real quick. Verse 22 through 23. We'll start in verse 21. Because that's probably the most important verse here. And then we'll finish up. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. You can't do that on a Sunday morning. I'm sorry. You just can't. Verse 22. Now this is a scripture I used to quote to my wife when we first got married. Didn't go over well. (laughs) Wives, submit to your husbands as you do to the Lord. Amen. Amen. Then I would stop there. And she would say, read verse 23. (laughs) For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, which is of, he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit to their husbands and everything. And then here's the verse. Husbands, love your wives. (laughs) See that sound right there? Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Wow. Men, just swallow your pride and zip it. I'm serious. You don't have to fix everything. You just have to be the greatest among you shall become servant of all. As men, that should be our goal in the home. Not to dictate to everybody. Not to control everything. I realized that when I tried to control my life for my kids, they went farther away from me. But if I lay down my life for them and love them, it's amazing how much they just open themselves and just blossom. Fathers, husbands, we have so much responsibility. And if you've, made, if you've messed things up, go make things right. Do what you know to do. It, it's, it doesn't mean you're, it's over with. 
I'm just saying that I'm not going to go down the road that my parents went down. I love my parents. They're incredible people. But I don't, we don't believe in divorce. We think it's wrong. We think it's sin. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be popular today. I'm just trying to stick to the scripture because popularity has, has ruined the church in this day and age. And we're not really caring about enough what's in God's heart to change this world. To make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with the water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body but they feed it and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two should become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Why am I sharing that? Because I'll tell you this. When we first move to the Philippines, I'm going to close with this. When we first moved to the Philippines, we just came out of Brownsville Revival. I was a ministry school student for two years or so. And all I wanted to do was see God use us and, and see Him move in power. That's, that's a good thing, right? Well, things weren't always right between us. We weren't in agreement. And you know what happened? Is that we got to the Philippines with the four other families and all five families lived in one house together. That'll stretch things. Same washer and dryer. Same kitchen. Yeah. Rubber band's no good unless it's stretched, right? <laughs> stretch you. Teach you things about yourself instead of complaining about other people all the time. And for six months, we said as a team, we're not going to do any ministry. We're going to pray two hours a day as a team. And then our own individual prayer time, family time, and stuff like that. That was five days a week. That was an intense period of time. Come June, ready to launch out, we have a big blow-up fight. Casey was wrong. No, 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 I'm kidding. But I'll tell you something the Lord spoke to me. And he said, Eric, you have a great love for revival and my church. But if you don't learn to love the woman that I've put in front of you, you'll never have the affections for my bride that I want you to have. Boyfriend, that hit me right here. Because if you stick around the next service, I'm going to talk about revival. Having a burning heart. What does that mean? I'm just going to tell you, I absolutely love and adore my wife, my kids. And I'm not pointing a finger at all the people that disagree in the world or even in the church. I'm just pointing a finger here. Saying, God, change my heart. Help me to love people the way that you love them. I am longing to see God pour out His Spirit in revival and awakening again. But I know that whether I see it again or not, I'm going to do whatever I can to make sure that I prepare the way for those to come after me. I want to raise the standard so high so that my kids have a greater you know, place to step off from. I believe marriage and the family are God's standard to stand against the flood of wickedness. Trump's not the answer. Shh. I'm not even talking about politics. I don't, I don't, look, I know it's important who we vote for. I get that. But I'm going to just tell you, if we keep thinking, well, things will change when someone else gets in office. That's what happens all the time in America. 
and we still have the problems and they get worse. When are we going to come to a point where we personally feel responsible for America? I see people having flags outside their homes, you know, cuss words towards Biden. I'm going fr- to tell you, friend, that's wicked. I, I didn't vote for Biden. And I disagree with most of, it, of his politics. But I will say this. As Christians, if we don't get the heart of God for people and go lower and stop trying to control, it's only a picture of what's happening in the home. And this is why men just leave and go do their own thing. Well, she didn't meet my needs. She didn't do what I wanted her to. Friend, I'm just going to tell you, be a man. Be rooted and established in the love of the Father. I know it's hard. It's hard for everybody. It was hard for Jesus when he had nails go through his hands and feet. You haven't had that yet. I'm just telling you, there's something that God wants to do in America, and I'm not going to stand before God one day and have to give an account. What did you do at that time after I took you out of the Philippines and put you in America? What did you do at that time? Did you seek me? Did you complain the whole time? Did you worry? Were you anxious? Were you stressed out? No, Lord. We were on fire. We stayed faithful. We went deeper in our relationship. Our kids blossomed. Everywhere we went, we preached the truth. I can't, we can only plant and water seeds. I can't make things grow. And you may be doing these things, and I pray that you are. I pray that you feel the fire of God burning in your heart. But I'm asking you, friend, to take responsibility. Would you stand? I, I know it's kind of late. Are we okay, Tim? Yes, sir. Okay. I just want to give an opportunity today Father in Jesus name I pray that in taking back the rainbow we're not talking about bringing bringing out a a bigger gun and intimidating people Lord we're talking about laying our lives down as Jesus did in humility Yes. yes we stand up for the truth Lord but we do it with love God, I pray if there's any marriage or family today in this room that's broken or just needs a refreshment of you, I pray that we would allow you to touch us in a way so that you can restore all things, God, because you are our Heavenly Father and you desire for us to look like and talk like and think like and act like you. You gave us an example. Jesus, you were the perfect Son and you served the perfect Father. We have no excuses except to be honest with ourselves before you. Friend, as I'm praying right now, if you need forgiveness, if in some way you feel like you need to humble yourself before God, this might be the most difficult thing you've ever had to do. It might be, it might be challenging today, but you know that you're right with God and God's just wanting some things to get in alignment. Whatever the situation is, if you need to make things right with God, or with your family, with your marriage, your wife, your your husband. I want to encourage you just to come up here and just seek the Lord. Just come up to the front here. I know, look, when you do that, shame breaks. It loses power. Don't worry about what other people, I don't care what anybody else knows. What God knows is what's important. And when these things break off of you, because you come to him and say, Lord, I humble myself. I need you to touch me. I need you to touch my family. I'm telling you, that's what the enemy doesn't want. Come on, somebody else. You need Jesus today. I'm telling you, sir, if you humble yourself, God will move. Or you can keep being hard-headed. And if you're hard-headed... You're only going to make things worse down the road. Because as you deny the Lord what He wants to do in an opportunity to serve you today and bring breakthrough, you make it more difficult on yourself. Hey, we always reap what we sow. If we if we come and plant, say, God, plant a seed in my heart. 
Okay, it doesn't matter what's going on, my friend. I, I had a word a, a couple of weeks ago. We were in Ackworth, Georgia, staying at someone's home. They had a home group come. Probably about 15 plus people that came. And I gave all kinds of words. Casey and I did. We were praying. God was moving. And at the end, I had this last word. And I said, I see three X's like on the family feud, right? <laughs> and I said, there's two X's here. And God says there won't be a third. I said, is that word for anybody? Nobody stood up. Nobody said anything. And then as the meeting closed down, a man came up to me at the end and said, brother, I just want to know you were hearing from God today. He said, I'm on my third marriage. And God told me today that this is the last one. I, look, I don't understand all the detail. He's saying, I don't have a right to forfeit. He, he was humbling himself. I don't understand all the details, but I know this, is that when we respond in humility to the Lord, oh, friend, that's all he's looking for. He'll do the rest. Don't try and figure everything out. If you got unforgiveness, if you if you got hatred in your heart towards a spouse, maybe your kids are wayward. I, friend, I'm just telling you, let God remove that bitterness today and heal. For every heart to believe, for every voice to cry out, burn like a fire.